Hello, my name is Aron. I'm from Southfield, Michigan in the United States. Uh, and I'm currently an adjunct professor at Lawrence Tech. And today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, one of my projects uh, called AutoCoin, which is a method for automatically producing high resolution photographs and profilometric depth maps of numismatic pieces. So a little bit about me. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree in biochemistry from Michigan State University. I've also studied nematodes. Uh, these are little worms uh, at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And my master's degree is in biomedical engineering from Lawrence Tech, where I studied 3D microphotography. And that's what got me interested in numismatic photography. Um, I'm not an expert on numismatics, so I apologize if I do make any mistakes or say something strange. Uh, feel free to uh, comment or ask questions at the end of the talk. And currently I'm an adjunct professor uh, at this university and I do research into metal 3D printing, which I will provide an example of involving uh, coin photography. And then this is just a little fun picture of me uh, that's actually right behind me is a large 3D printed head that I uh, wear sometimes as a joke. Uh, and I say that it is to protect me during the pandemic. So a little bit about the project background. Um, I, like I said, I was intending to do 3D micro photography. And so this first system that I built is actually made out of Blu-ray disc players which you may have found thrown away on the side of the road. And the idea behind here is to rotate a very small object like this little red wheel here, while you move a digital microscope and the sample back and forth and up and down. And this way you can see all sides of the object and take many, many, many pictures that get combined together in software into a 3D image. And this is actually how I met Andres um, because he does research uh, into um, in this area involving Blu-ray disc players. And so he contacted me about them. Uh, and also we've been, uh, I was working on this automatic coin photography project. So you know, he invited me to give this talk. So special thanks to Andres also for translating this talk. Here's an example of this 3D microphotography. Uh, this is the last time in this talk that you will see an insect. So if you, you know, are closing your eyes, I'll tell you when to open them again. So the idea here is we take many small pictures, combine them together, and then do that repeatedly as we rotate the object. And so we get an unlimited field of view. And at the same time, we can rotate our object and see it from all sides. And you can open your eyes again. So this method is actually more effective on larger objects. Because if you zoom into a very small area, you have a high magnification, but you have a very small field of view the amount of the object you can see at once. So if you have a microscope with a given magnification, this effect scales. You can see the same magnification over the entire area. Whereas if you were using a regular digital camera, you would have to zoom in less to see a large object. So moving on to coins, uh, these are my first attempts at uh, scanning coins. Clearly, there is something wrong with them. Um, I think what's something that's funny is when I post pictures like this on Facebook or Instagram, they actually get a lot more attention than successful pictures. So that might tell you something about the internet. Um, but all of these have flaws. They are either stitched wrong or the color balance is insane. Um, and this is an issue that I am still actively fighting against, but as you will see in this talk is, you know, it's better than this.
here we have an example of my first successful scan um, of, a, of a penny, um, nothing really special here. Um, but what I would point out is that even though the actual resolution of this image is not spectacular, um, you could do the same thing with a standard digital camera. You could see this whole coin at this resolution. The detail is actually pretty good. You can see every spot and indentation. It's all sharp and clear. And so this method fundamentally does have some advantages uh, with detail. Pixel count is not everything. So here is an upgrade uh, to a 3D printer setup that's also behind me right there. This is a 3D printer that I broke uh, by accident. And I replaced the main board computer with a Raspberry Pi computer. I added in my digital microscope, and then I added in a couple more motors. Let's try not to deafen you here. So here I'm showing that I have improved my, um, my motion control from four axis to five axis. So I use this for more complex photography, like of drill bits or dental crowns or insects. But that's not the subject of this talk. It's about numismatics. So I just want to show you here, uh, you know, an example of a object with a large area that's been scanned. I actually would say that I scan this at a low resolution. Um, by low resolution, I mean that uh, this image took about 600 images to form. Whereas if I use my higher resolution setting, it would take about 30,000. So I would not recommend scanning an object this large at high resolution. But if we were to just take a look at it, we can see that we can zoom in still quite a bit to all of the detail we would normally not see with our naked eye. And before you get the idea, uh, this, this $50 bill actually has a lot of problems with it in the scan. There are subtle distortions that are introduced by the scanning process, uh, problems with color. You might notice that the, coin, the scan is warped. That is a consequence of the scanning process, not the individual photographs. So this can be improved, but for now, please don't try to take a picture of this and hand it in at your local bank. It will not work and I'll get in trouble. So please don't do that. Now we have some good uh, images of coins. So this is a Canadian toonie. This is 1000 stitched images. So this image was 600 and then this is 1000. So that's the difference between scanning at a high resolution versus a low resolution with this method. I don't recommend again, scanning very, very large objects with this resolution, though of course you can. That's the advantage of this method. So what I did here is I use the method of mixing and max matching images. So I took many images and I took them at multiple depths, at multiple Z heights. And then I just picked which ones were in focus and then I combined them into one image. One disadvantage with this method is it doesn't perform well around areas that are uh, bumpy, that have sharp corners, or a lot of height variation in the single image because it mixes and matches images. It doesn't actually combine them. But still, this method is uh, it's still pretty good. You get um, this, this image is 400 megapixels, so 400 million pixels. And actually, uh, after I took this image, I decided to um, reduce the image size because you can actually reduce the image size without losing quality. But again, this does not have stacking. This is an image of an Indian head penny. 
Um, and this does have stacking. Um, it's not an automatic um, scan yet. I will show you that. Um, but this does incorporate stacking so that areas like this with have some depth within each image, you can see that depth. It's not blurry in some areas. And then this brings us to our current system. I still use a 3D printer to move my camera, but instead of using an embedded computer like a Raspberry Pi, I use a Windows machine and I control the machine, I control the 3D printer with G code, which is a programming language meant for CNC machines. I'm also using a better camera. And as a combination of these facts, I can do faster real time vision tasks, as you'll see like autofocus or automatic coin boundary detection. And this is where the auto coin comes into play. Here we have a one touch autofocus. So it uses the clarity of the image to tell whether it's in focus or not and moves the camera accordingly. Wooden nickel. And then this shows how it finds the coin. So it actually automatically finds the coin and determines the boundaries of the coin automatically. It does this by looking for out of focus objects after focusing against the build plate. You can see it's determined the perimeter of the coin. This is the uh, teaser image for this lecture. It says in cod we trust, in English uh, cod is a kind of fish, maybe in Spanish too. It also automatically determines the depth variation of the coin. So it moves the camera up and down repeatedly across different parts of the coin to see how much depth variation there is. It's using the circles and circle packing problem, which might not mean anything to you. And then it starts the scan automatically. And I'd note that it doesn't perform a rectangular scan, but it actually follows a circular path to save time. Right there, sorry, I got a little bit caught behind. And right here, it actually talks about um, some other features, like it can automatically scan multiple coins sequentially. So you might have guessed that this is not a very fast process. Um, it can scan about uh, 1,000 images for every five or 10 minutes. So a very large coin might be 7,000 images or so and take approximately an hour. So what I like about this, how I programmed it, is I put several coins on the build plate at once. It will scan one, and then it'll move on to the next coin. So how I imagine this being used in a numismatic setting is you would put some coins on you know, at the beginning of the day, and you'd have them in the evening, or at night, and you'd have them when you wake up in the morning. It also automatically sorts the files and removes blurry pictures. 
And then here it says that automatic basic stitching and 3D depth map generation is in progress. Uh, as we will see, uh, that is no longer in progress, that is done. All right. So uh, I can't uh, avoid talking about some of the problems we have. Uh, so one problem is that in this video, we did not stack before we did stitching. Uh, we were using that mix and matching method I mentioned earlier. And so we can see that in areas of a lot of depth variation, there are parts that are blurry and parts that are in focus, which is not ideal. So in these images, we have this problem solved. Now we do automatic stacking of each of the small component images before they are stitched together. And that is, again, it's automatic. It's part of um, the program. It's not using external software to do this. So here we have a, a silver Ducato from uh, Italy. And we have the back of it as well. And of course, if you would like to see any of these coins in more detail, um, I do have them um, right here on this computer. Uh, and at the end of the talk, I will be happy to show you them um, and you can have them. Uh, I'll send them to you very happily. Uh, this is one of my, my favorite images, uh, a Roman uh, Antonianus, um, where you can actually see, I, it's a GIF, so I can't just uh, stop it, but you can actually see the individual strikes of the coin. You know, I will actually show you, I can show you here. So here we have number 11. Here's our image. And we can actually see when we zoom in, we can see the individual strikes from thousands of years ago, we can see exactly how many times they hit our coin when they were making it, which I think is spectacular. I would never have noticed that if I was just looking at it with my naked eye, but that is one advantage of taking images with this super high resolution. Another problem uh, in this last video, if you have a keen eye, you may have noticed, um, perhaps you're only in this talk because you noticed it with this teaser image, um, but these images actually have a lot of problems with color so far. So I'm using a digital microscope, but I don't or I didn't have complete control over every setting like exposure or color compensation. So as a result, especially gold coins like these, they develop a noticeable bluish tint, or rather the image is trying to compensate for the bright color. And so around gold areas, gold edges, you get this bluish color and the whole coin looks rather drab or colorless. So in this teaser image, I've actually digitally enhanced this coin, I've, uh, I've removed the background and I've played around with color saturation um, and it looks more like a gold coin now, but it's still not really correct. Uh, this is not representative of the real coin. Um, I tricked you, but this is not really what it looks like in real life. So here in this new video, um, I'm showing you that we actually have solved this. Um, and all, all I did really is I found out how to use the color, um, how to change the color compensation from automatic to static with my digital microscope. And in a final production version, um, this would be further improved. Um, this would be further improved. So here I'm actually showing a full scan again. This is all one take. It is time lapse, so it's quite a bit faster but this is showing you how it's zeroing against the build plate. It's searching for the coin. And then once it's found, finds the coin, it determines the coin's outline.
it's a very, very basic method. Uh, it's not incredibly robust, um, but it does work. And once it finds the coin, it does that depth search to look for the points that are in focus. We can see our camera moving up and down. So this does work for bumpy coins as well as relatively flat ones. And now it's performing the entire scan. So this scan is about 7,000 images, six, 7,000 or so. And then once our scan is done, we can see the result. Whoops, technical mishap. We can see this result of our gold coin that looks a lot more natural. This is very close to what it looks like in real life. And a special surprise, we now have automatic depth map generation capability. So when you stack your individual component images, this artifact actually represents one of the images. When you stack them, you know which pixels were in focus. That's how stacking works. And so we just use that information to color in the pixels white if they are closer to the user and black if they are further away from the user. And it's not, you know, extremely, extremely, extremely precise, but it does give you some information about the depth variation of the coin. And I think it looks really cool. And back to our coin. And zooming in to show the detail that we have available to us. And again. And actually, this image is compressed uh, because if I kept it at the original resolution of about 1 billion pixels, uh, my video editing software would not accept it. OK. And we are nearing the end of our talk. But like I said, this produces two and a half dimensional depth maps. And we can see in this, in our Roman coin, we can see our depth map. And once you have the depth map, it's actually quite simple to 3D print these coins. Uh, you put it into any normal 3D printing software. And it assumes that it is known as a lithophane, which is just a printable photograph, and it prints quite well. So here is a 3D print of this coin. And I said that I'm doing research into metal 3D printing. And my method of metal 3D printing is actually to 3D print plastic mixed with metal. So this is actually plastic mixed with metal. And then you put it into an oven and the metal gets sintered or stuck together. So this is after sintering at over 1,000 degrees Celsius and then washing with acid, which shines it up. And I actually have this coin right here. So this is a coin that was scanned with this method and then 3D printed in metal. And then I will bury it to confuse numismatists for 1,000 years. And then this brings us finally to yesterday's coins. So you can see that I'm actually actively still working on this. I scanned these coins once I heard um, that I was going to be giving this talk. Uh, and so unfortunately, I could not find any coins from Argentina, but I did find Latin American coins from Mexico. Here is our first image, 1948, five Mexican pesos with depth map included. There's the back of it. So we can see what kind of image, what kind of detail we have. And actually this is not even the full size because otherwise it would not fit on the screen, even just this, this part. I think that's a dragon head, looks cool.
and another Mexican coin. And the back of it. I like these talons. Now this is very cool. And then our closing thoughts. The scanner is still not perfect. Uh, you may have seen more artifacts, like a pattern that's a result of the scan, or this banding pattern, which was the result of my, uh, my microscope cord getting caught in the printer, which I was not expecting to have that problem, but it does result in strange problems like this. And then I say that this is automatic and in the video it was completely automatic, but it's only flawless about 60% of the time. Um, but I'm hopeful that with more time and resources, it can be improved further. I think there's a lot of, a lot of potential still to be realized with this method. Uh, with that last year, I launched um, a Kickstarter, which you might know is a method of crowdfunding uh, for projects like this. Um, I unfortunately, I was kind of overreaching my goal. I didn't really have the plan for, you know, what I was going to do with the money. It was in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, so I did cancel this, but I do hope that if you are interested, um, you might contact, contact me or sign up uh, to know when you might be able to just buy one of these systems um, and be able to use it without, you know, being a developer like me. And so with that, a special thank you um, to our host uh, and its president, and definitely a special thank you to our translator, uh, not just for translating, but organizing this event, and reaching out to me for the first time. If you want to see um, these images, I do have many of them, not all of them, um, and links to more of my projects at my website, which is just my name, ourownwayne.com. In Zoom, it might be spelled a little bit differently, but it's A-H-R-O-N-W-A-Y-N-E.com. That's my email as well. And with that, uh, I am done talking. I'm done recording this. Um, and uh, it should be flash forward to Saturday. And I will open the floor for questions. So thank you very much.